Hi, welcome to this lecture on operating modes. Okay, so last class we were talking about uh, symmetric key ciphers, stream ciphers and block ciphers. Operating modes are related to block ciphers, so let's just get into it. So recall that a block cipher uh, encrypts a fixed size block of data using a fixed size key. So in this particular example here, we have a key of 256 bits and we're going to use that along with AES, which is a block cipher, to encrypt 128 bits of plain text data and produce 128 bits of cipher text data. And it's very important with block ciphers to note that you're only encrypting a, encrypting a fixed size block. So you take in 128 bits, you output 128 bits. You can't encrypt anything smaller than the block size or bigger than the block size. The algorithm encrypts exactly one block every single time. So what if we want to encrypt a larger message? So what if I need something that's more than just a block? So as an example, you know, AES has this 128 bit, which is a 16 byte block size. What if I want to encrypt, say, a 30 megabyte video file or a 20 megabyte audio file or just about anything that's bigger than 16 bytes? What do I do? Well, this is where block cipher operating modes come into place because we need to break up the data in whatever it is we want to encrypt into blocks that are the size of the block cipher blocks and then we need to encrypt those. The way that we do that, how we partition it up and how we perform that encryption uh, has significant impacts on security and hopefully you'll see that today as we look through it. It also impacts performance. Now there are five traditional ways uh, that that you, that you break things up, and we call these operating modes. In this lecture, I'm going to cover three of them, and I also want to mention that there's more than even the five traditional ways. So there, there's lots of different operating modes, um, but the truth is, if, if you understand these three, then you have the basis, at least, for being able to understand the others if you ever need to. Okay, so the first operating mode is called Electronic Codebook, or ECB. I don't know where it got its name, but that's the name. Uh, this is kind of the obvious method where it, at first glance, if you think, well, how do I use a block cipher to encrypt a big file? This is what everybody comes up with on their first try. You break data into blocks, and then you just encrypt each block independently using the key. So you get a diagram that looks something like this, where, okay, uh, I take my plain text, which is up here at the top, and I break it into fixed size blocks. In this case, there's three of them. And I take each block, and I encrypt it with with the same key and I get out my ciphertext, so I get three different ciphertext blocks. And I put those ciphertext blocks together and that becomes my ciphertext. So break up my plain text into blocks, encrypt each block with the encryption algorithm using the same key, get my ciphertext. So that's, that's fairly straightforward, makes sense, it's intuitive. Uh, uh, decryption is also intuitive. I break up my ciphertext into blocks and I run it through the block cipher decryption operation. So you may remember from the last lecture that I mentioned that block ciphers have an encrypt and a decrypt operation. You have to specify which one you're doing. Uh, in this case, we're going to do the decryption operation to convert each ciphertext block into its corresponding plain text block. Like I said, straightforward, easy, makes a lot of sense. It's got a problem. One thing you're going to learn about cryptography is the straightforward and easy approach always has a problem. In this case, the same plain text blocks always produce the same cipher text blocks. Now this is just like a substitution cipher in simple ciphers. So you may remember that one issue we had with a substitution cipher is that the same plain text letter always becomes the same cipher text letter. So an attacker can analyze the cipher text in that way, kind of do a frequency analysis in order to help break the substitution cipher. Well, if you use ECB, that same property is true, same plain text always becomes the same cipher text, and an attacker can do a similar type of frequency analysis to break it. How do they do that? Well, a lot of computer files, just like languages, um, have patterns to them. So a lot of computer files will have duplicate blocks, and we don't want an attacker to be able to tell this. So think of an image file, for example. So if this is my plain text, and it's just an image file. You can imagine that, that as that image file goes through and it defines each pixel, you could easily end up in a situation where black, you know, somewhere here, has the exact same data stored as black here. 
Well, an attacker who analyzes the ciphertext of this image might be able to tell that because the encryption of this pixel would look identical to the encryption of that pixel. In fact, if I do encrypt this picture of the Linux Penguin with, an e with AES in ECB mode, and then I just take that encryption and I convert it back into an image, I, I see something like this. And you can see that that property does indeed occur. The white background ends up encrypting to something similar because every pixel of white looks the same. The black ends up encrypting to something similar. All the blacks look the same, et cetera, et cetera. And, and if I look at that picture, I think, you know, I guess it's encrypted, but that reveals a lot more information than maybe I intended with the idea of encryption. So this is a big issue with ECB. And in fact, this is the main reason that ECB is unwise to use in almost any scenario. There's very few cases where you would actually want to use ECB. But it's there as an operating mode because it's the basic case and it's the most intuitive and obvious one. So an improvement on ECB is called cipher block chaining or CBC. In CBC, each block is dependent on the previous one. So in electronic code book, all the blocks are independent. Just plain text, key, gets you cipher text. In this case, the blocks are going to be dependent on the one that came before it. And adding that one simple change fixes many of the problems that ECB had. So here's a diagram of encryption in CBC. So what happens here is, let's look at this middle encryption block. So we have our plain text, and it gets exclusive ORD with the ciphertext from the previous block. So the ciphertext of the previous block is exclusive ORD with the plain text of the current block, and that is fed into the encryption algorithm, which then produces the ciphertext, and that ciphertext is used as ciphertext, and it's also fed into the next encryption. So every ciphertext is dependent on the plain text of its block and the previous ciphertext. We've just added this extra dependency of the previous ciphertext. So it, it makes sense, and we'll look at the decryption in a little bit, but uh, not every block has a previous block, right? The, the first block doesn't. So the first block has no previous block, so we've included something that we call an initial vector. Well, an initial vector is there because there's no previous block. So what we do is we pick a random value and we call it the initial vector. And random, by random I mean it's chosen in such a way that it's not really predictable, but even if it is predictable, it really doesn't matter. It's just a value chosen to fill in for that. That initial vector is not a secret. And so we can send it along with whatever we need. So how does decryption work in this scenario? Well, it's just the opposite of the encryption diagram. When we want to decrypt, we take the ciphertext, we run it through the decryption, and that gets us out some data that, that remember, when we encrypted it, was the plain text exclusive ORD with the previous item, or in this case, the initial vector. So we exclusive ORD that with the initial vector, or here, the old ciphertext, and then we get back the original plaintext. Now this works because of the same properties that allowed exclusive OR to work well with stream ciphers. When you encrypt some, when you exclusive OR something, and you exclusive OR it with that same item again later, you remove the item. So uh, if you go back and you take a look at this and you analyze it the same way that I analyzed exclusive OR before for stream ciphers, you'll see that it also works here. Okay, so CBC, I said, fixes a lot of the problems of ECB. And the main one is this one-to-one -one plain text ciphertext mapping. Okay, so remember we had our plain text, and when we encrypted it with ECB and we converted it back to an image, it looked like this, which doesn't look all that secret to me. Well, if you do it with CBC, you get this, which looks like complete random static. Now, I don't want to mislead you into thinking that looking like static means that something is encrypted properly, but this should at least show you that the one-to-one -one mapping problem disappears. Because even though black is duplicated in multiple locations, and here it looks the same, in CBC it would be dependent on the previous block as well, and so that chains through and removes that one-to-one -one mapping. But there's still a problem with CBC. And that main problem is that if I want to change the plain text of one block, I have to re-encrypt every following block, because it's a chain, right? Every, every block is dependent on the previous block's ciphertext. So if I change the plain text of one block, that changes its ciphertext, which changes the ciphertext of the next block, which changes the ciphertext of the next block, and the next block, etc., etc., etc. For some use cases, this would be bad. 
Uh, one example would be an encrypted file system or an encrypted file in general, because frequently with file systems or files, I need to just read off one block of the data, change it, and write it back encrypted. Well, if I use CBC as my, as my operating mode, then I would also have to re-encrypt every following block. And that would be very inefficient on something like a file system. So th there are other types of operating modes that don't have that problem. Uh, one example is called counter. We abbreviate it CTR, but we call it counter. And counter mode actually simulates a stream cipher. We take a block cipher and we effectively turn it into a stream cipher. Because each block is encrypted ind ind independently, but it involves an incrementing nonce in order to prevent this repeatability issue. Uh, a nonce, just as a side note, is a number that's chosen randomly, but it's not a secret. It, it's actually basically identical to an initial vector in terms of how we choose it and what we do with it, uh, but it has a different name just because of how it's used. The initial vector is called an initial vector because it, it happens for the initial block in an operating mode. Um, but here, because we're using it with every block, we just call it a nonce. Different name, same basic concept. So what does encryption look like in counter mode? And this is where hopefully you'll see how this simulates a stream cipher. So we take our nonce, which is just some randomly chosen number, and we put a counter on the end of it. And every block, that counter increments. So the zeroth block, the counter is zero. The first block, the counter is one. The second block, the counter is two, et cetera, et cetera. We encrypt that value with the key. So the nonce plus counter encrypted with the key gets me this output here. Same thing here, same thing here. Now that output's going to be different for all three of these because the counter changes. So they're encrypting different values. And then I take that, which is effectively key stream, and I XOR it with the plain text to get the ciphertext. So I want you to think for a moment about why this simulates a stream cipher. Each one of these block encryptions produces a piece of keystream. And that keystream is not dependent on the plain text at all. So the plain text doesn't come in until after the encryption has already occurred. So all we're doing is incrementing a, a nonce plus counter and producing keystream each time. Then that keystream is exclusive word with plain text in order to get ciphertext. Decryption in this case uh, operates how you would expect with one important thing I want to I want to mention, which is that remember we're producing keystream. So we need to produce the exact same keystream. So we're actually, almost non-intuitively, going to use the encryption operation of the block cipher, even though we're decrypting with counter mode. And the reason for that is that we don't actually care, because we're not using this block cipher to encrypt or decrypt our data. We're just using it to produce keystream. So we just need to use the same operation. That will produce the same keystream. We can XOR that with the ciphertext and get back our plain text. So operating modes are something you need to spend more time reading and thinking about in order to get them. So remember that first class where I said that one problem is that when you tell students to go off and study something on their own, they don't do it? Well, you might want to actually do this. We'll see if it happens. But um, these can be difficult to comprehend, and there's nothing you can do but spend time thinking about them in order to understand them better. They're hard at first. The first time you look at them, they don't make a lot of sense. In fact, right now you're probably thinking, I'm not sure these make a lot of sense. But once you begin to understand them, they get easier and easier. So I recommend that you read the Wikipedia entry on block cipher mode of operation. In fact, all of the encryption and decryption images from this lecture are from that Wikipedia page. It's very well written, uh, surprisingly. Uh, actually, all of the cryptography stuff on Wikipedia is very well written. Apparently, cryptographers love to write on Wikipedia. Uh, and you should learn the strengths and weaknesses of block ciphers. And just as a general rule, because everybody always needs general rules, uh, for most use cases when you're implementing something with cryptography, cipher block chaining is what you want to use. You never want to use ECB. Counter mode can be useful in certain circumstances, such as file system operations or a few others. But in general, CBC is what you want, and it works fairly well. So, summing up. When using block ciphers to encrypt data that's bigger than one block, you need to figure out some way that you're going to split up that data before you encrypt it. In this case, you're going to use an operating mode. And your choice of operating mode has a bunch of consequences because it impacts the security of your final data, the performance, et cetera, et cetera. So those are important choices. So uh, that's operating modes, and uh, thanks a lot.